This video is all about hyperbolic functions. So often students are given these kind of bizarre expressions, but why are they connected geometrically to hyperbolas that are so useful? And if you're a fan of the channel, you will see hyperbolic functions coming up in my videos about bubbles, about the math of war and the geometry of hyperbolic spaces more generally. Let's start on the analytic side with these messy formulas. If I start with a function like e to the x, I can flip it over the y-axis by considering e to the minus x. And then I can flip that over the x-axis by considering the negative of e to the negative of x. But check out what happens with just good old cosine of x. Cosine of x is what we call an even function, and that means that when I flip it over the y-axis by considering cosine of minus x, then I get back exactly the same thing. Now, I'm going to connect this to hyperbolic functions in just a moment, don't you worry, but I want to in general define what even and odd functions are. An even function is one where f of negative x is the same thing as f of x, and an odd function is one where f of negative x is the negative of f of x. Then there's something kind of cool I can do with even and odd functions. If you give me an f of x, then I can define what I will call f even and f odd. f even is just like the average of f and f negative x, and f odd is like the average between f and negative f of negative x. And I haven't made up this naming, these actually are even and odd functions. Like if I take f even here and I put negatives in, well, Negative of a negative is just the same thing of x, and this is exactly where I started. So this really is even. In contrast with f odd, if I was to put negatives in everywhere, the negative of the negative cleans up. When I flip this around, it's now got a negative stuck out the front. So f odd is indeed an odd function. But what's cool about f even and f odd is that I can take any function f of x and write it as the sum of an even component and an odd component. Indeed, those f of negative x's, they cancel. You get two copies of f of x divided by two. If I substitute this in, this is just f of x. Okay, all of that preamble was for this particular moment. Let me plug in the specific function e to the x as my function. In this case, my f even is e to the x plus e to the minus x over two, and my odd e to the x minus e to the minus x divided by two. These are even and odd functions, and the sum of them is just e to the x. I am going to call these hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine. So from an analytical perspective, just looking at the formulas, the definition of hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine is just the split into its even and its odd component. I haven't yet explained why this has anything to do with hyperbolas, but I'm just saying that hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine are natural things to consider. They're the even and the odd components of exponential, a function that we know has enormous importance in mathematics. Now that I've defined them, I can graph them. To graph hyperbolic cosine of x, I'm just going to take the e to the x, I'm going to take the e to the minus x, and I'm going to take their average, which gives this very nice plot of hyperbolic cosine. And indeed, visually, that looks like an even function. And then hyperbolic sine is going to just be the average of e to the x and negative e to the negative x, which creates this odd function. And then you can check that if you add up hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine at any given point, it's going to add up to what you would expect for e to the x visually. If you know about Taylor series and calculus, I have one more cool thing to tell you, or skip forward to the next timestamp for the geometry. This is the Taylor series for exponential 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial and so forth. If this was a polynomial, the even powers of that polynomial are going to behave like an even function. That's where the name comes. And the odd powers like an odd function. So I can take this Taylor series expansion for e to the x and I can imagine breaking it up. All of the even terms that goes into the even component of exponential, in other words, hyperbolic cosine. and all of the odd terms become hyperbolic sine. So you get power series definitions for hyperbolic cos and hyperbolic sine out of this even odd analysis for the Taylor series of e to the x. And I can either use the series representation or my original definition just to check that you have relationships like that the derivative of hyperbolic cosine is just hyperbolic sine. Indeed, you can check that for every term when you take a derivative, it brings the power down, cancels one of the things in factorial and gives you exactly what you get for hyperbolic sine. Similarly, 
the derivative of hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic cosine. Except for a missing minus sign, this is very similar to the derivative relationship between sine and cosine, the non-hyperbolic versions. Now we need to connect this to the geometry. Here I put up the plots of a circle and of a hyperbola, and they're very similar. For the circle, it's just x squared plus y squared equal to one, and for the hyperbola, well, x squared minus y squared equal to one. Now you might remember the Pythagorean identity for trigonometry that sine squared plus cos squared equal to one and satisfies the equation of a circle. Let's do the same kind of analysis for the hyperbola for this equation x squared minus y squared equal to one. If I take x to be hyperbolic cosine of some other variable, let's call it theta, and y to be hyperbolic sine, then I can just go and take this x and y and I can plug them into the definition of my hyperbola. Well, if I expand all of these out, I get this sort of long messy expression. There's a whole lot of canceling going on. And what do I get? It's just equal to one. And this tells me that hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine, they satisfy the equation of a hyperbola. So that's a little bit satisfying. You might think I've made my big connection, except Actually, lots of pairs of functions like that satisfy the equation of a hyperbola, like x equals tan theta and y is secant theta, you can plug it in and check it yourself. That also, when you plug it in, is equal to one. So it's nice that hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine do satisfy the equation of a hyperbola, but there's many ways to travel a hyperbola parametrically, and this is only one of them. So why is this one so special? To more deeply understand this connection, let's go back to the definition of the regular trig functions. The way I define sine of theta and cos of theta is I imagine that I am at a point on the unit circle making some angle theta with the positive horizontal axis, and then I define the horizontal component of that point to be cosine of theta, and I define the vertical component to be sine of theta. These are the geometric definitions of the cos and sine function. Then I can deduce the graph of, say, cosine of theta, where I'm just gonna follow along with what my horizontal component is doing and let the height of this cosine function just be the length of that horizontal component. This gives the familiar cosine graph. And similarly, we can generate a plot of sine of theta by looking at how the vertical component of my point is moving as I increase theta. Now, that standard definition of cosine and sine that's related to this angle of theta could actually be restated in terms of area. That is, I can imagine that at this angle of theta, I also have a region that's shaded out, and I can ask what's the area of that region. This is a simple computation to do. Theta can go between zero and two pi, so if you're at an angle of theta, you're a proportion theta over two pi of the total area of a circle, which for a unit circle is pi times one squared. So all this is to say is that the area of that pizza slice is equal to the angle divided by two. To get rid of this division by two, I'm actually gonna set a larger area as my definition of the area here. So it's going both above and beneath the x-axis by that amount theta. And with this larger definition of area, I have the formula that area equals angle. What I can do then is imagine in my definition of cosine and sine of theta is that I instead replace it with the area divided by two. I imagine this is half of that total area. And then my definition of cosine and sine are just related to the area. It says you take the point on the circle that has this particular area and the horizontal component of that point is cosine and the vertical component is sine. That is to say, I'm sort of redefining cosine and sine to be functions depending on the area enclosed by wherever your point is, as opposed to the angle theta. Either is perfectly fine for trigonometry, but I'm doing all of this so I can do the same area definition to define geometrically the hyperbolic functions. Let me put a point on the hyperbola and let me imagine that I have an area enclosed, that same area divided by two. If you wanted to do the portion underneath the axis, it would be a total area of A. So I'm asking, where is the point such that you're enclosing this particular area? And then I wanna look at the horizontal and vertical components of that point. That I will geometrically define to be hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine. If you give me an area, then that area determines a point, and I can give you back hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine. 
with this geometric definition in mind, we can generate the same plots for hyperbolic functions that we saw before. For hyperbolic sine of a, then the height of that function at any point is just the height of the points on the hyperbola. And for hyperbolic cosine, then the height of the function is just the horizontal components of the points on the hyperbola. These give these beautiful functions for hyperbolic cosine and sine. So as of right now, I have two different definitions of hyperbolic cos and sine floating around. I have my analytic definition as the even and odd components of the function e to the x. And I have my geometric definition as the horizontal and vertical components of the point on a hyperbola that is swept out a specific area. So are they the same? I'd shown that the exponential ones I could plug in and could satisfy the equation, as did many other functions, but do they have this nice area property? To help me do that, I need to get a handle on what this area really is. And I'm going to note that I can add in this second region B, and A and B together just form a right triangle. So if I want to figure out what the area of A is, it's the area of the triangle, and an area of a triangle is one half base times height. So in this case, so in this case, it's hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine as my base and my height of my triangle. And then I subtract off the region B. I'm doing this because it's going to be a little easier to compute out the area of B and then take the difference than it is to go for A directly. So let's go for that area of B. Now the calculus students among you will find this a lovely practice of integration, which is, you know, how we figure out areas in calculus. I notice my curve is x squared minus y squared equal to 1. That was the definition of a hyperbola. I can rephrase that and say that y is square root of x squared minus 1. And so if I imagine slicing this region of B up into a whole bunch of vertical strips that look like this pink thing, then the vertical strips are going from 0 up to a height of square root of x squared minus 1. And thus, I'm going to take an integral of such things. I'm going to add up all of these little vertical strips here. I'm going to add up all of these x squareds minus 1s, and I'm doing it from a left point of 1 all the way out to a right point of hyperbolic cosine. This is just an integral. I'll let you figure out the details of evaluating that integral down in the comments if you're so interested, but here it is. There's the mess. And for our purposes, what I really want to focus in is that because I'm evaluating this at hyperbolic cosine, it turns out a lot of things simplify. Like, look at these two expressions where I've got square root of x squared minus 1. If I plug the bottom of, of 1, those are just going to be 0. So I don't have to worry about those at all. Same thing, logarithm of 1 is 0. When I plug in 1, everything's going to be 0 and go away. But when I plug in hyperbolic cosine, well, hyperbolic cosine squared minus 1 is just hyperbolic sine squared. We've already proven this identity. Square root that and you get hyperbolic sine. So you plug hyperbolic cosine into either of those yellow expressions and you just get hyperbolic sine. Okay, so what does that leave us with? It leaves us with this expression here where I've plugged in the hyperbolic cos and sine. But now I can leverage my original definition. We defined hyperbolic cos and hyperbolic sine as the even and odd components of exponential function. Their sum is just the exponential. And then it's easy. I have logarithm of an exponential. This is just going to be the value of a. And, well, divided by 2, so subtracting a divided by 2. I got the same expression on the front of both of these, which I can cancel. And as a result, the area of a is nothing but a divided by 2. So what I've shown is that with hyperbolic sine and cosine defined as the even and odd part of exponential, that was crucial to my derivation, I then get that geometric property that I wanted such that the area enclosed was just going to be a divided by 2. So these two different definitions are in fact the same. Now, I want to just scratch the surface on one other aspect of all of this where we talk about these as complex functions. You might be familiar with Euler's famous identity that e to the ix is cos x plus i sine of x. Contrast that famous identity with our definition of the hyperbolic functions as the sum of hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine. In our presentation, this is a definition, not a theorem. But notice the similarities between these. If I just plugged in i instead everywhere, well, then I have e to the ix on both sides. And so then if I compare these, cosine, the real component, is nothing but hyperbolic cosine of i times x. And similarly, sine of x is hyperbolic sine of i times x divided up by i. 
And so really cosine and hyperbolic cosine, sine and hyperbolic sine, can just be thought of as different sides of the same larger coin. Now, I'm a math YouTuber, I love math videos, and I hope that you do too. But to really master mathematics, you have to actually get your hands dirty doing mathematics. And that's why I am such a fan of the sponsor of today's video, which is Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an online learning platform with thousands of courses that are just delightfully interactive. You get to play with the animations and visualize what's going on, and you get to test yourself on your understanding as you learn the content. I had fun the other day going down the rabbit hole of their beautiful geometry course, which anyone who enjoyed this video might really like to play around with. So if you're looking to improve your mathematics skills or you just want to see a bunch of cool mathematics, I really encourage you to check out brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett. <laughs> That's me. The link is down in the description to check out everything that they have for free for a full 30 days or the first 200 of you who click the link are going to get an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.